to National Fisherman Live. I'm Leslie Taylor. This week on our program, Michael Crowley, National Fisherman's Boats and Gear Editor, talks about a new personal flotation device, and we take a closer look at a new app that fishermen in the Virgin Islands are using to enter required data about their catch via smartphone. But first, some fishing news from around the coasts. Haggling between buyers and sellers is nothing new in the Dungeness crab fishery. California's crab season opened December 1st, and fishermen south of Mendocino have been getting $3 a pound for their dungies. But in Northern California, crabbers say they would rather stay tied to the dock than take the $2.50 a pound that buyers are offering them for crabs. Dave Bitts of McKinleyville, one of those who is tied up over the price, believes a soft market is the culprit. We're 50 cents apart, says Bitts, who was selected a National Fisherman Highliner in 2007. Maybe, says Bitts, they just don't really want to buy crabs very bad right now. Jessica Hathaway, Editor-in-Chief of National Fisherman, explains some of the factors that complicate this picture for fishermen. The Dungeness crab fishery on the West Coast is certainly complicated, um, although in some ways it's simplified by the fact that uh, about 50% of the crab that's processed on the West Coast is um, processed by one, uh, one seafood dealer, and that's Pacific Seafood. So in many ways they control the stake, uh, the majority stake in uh, the negotiations between processors and fishermen on the price that they're going to pay for the Dungeness. So you have two primary regions of Dungeness crab fishing on the west coast. You've got central coast of California and then north of there is essentially one region and that includes the northern coast of California, Oregon, and the southern coast of Washington. Typically, the fishing in central coast of California begins in mid-November, so around November 15th, and north of there it begins on December 1st. So the negotiations for the price in central coast of California have already taken place when the fishing and negotiation begins north of there. This year, fishermen in um, central coast of California are getting 3 to 3.25 a pound for their crab and basically that's what fishermen right now are pushing for for their price negotiations in the northern part of the, of the west coast and right now processors in the northern part of the west coast are pushing for 250 so essentially they just need to come to an agreement on um, what the price is going to be and then they can start fishing around December 16th I think is when uh, northern coast of California, Oregon and southern Washington will start fishing Maine fishermen, who rely on the winter shrimp harvest to help them put together a year's work, are struggling to come to terms with the shutdown of their fishery. Last winter's harvest was the smallest in 35 years. The Atlantic State's Marine Fisheries Commission decided not to open the fishery this winter following a survey last summer that showed the northern shrimp stock at its lowest level since 1984. Regulators say the stock has collapsed. The shrimp industry employs hundreds along the coast of Maine. Many are fishermen, but scores of truck drivers, fish house employees, and other shoreside workers depend on the fishery to get them through the winter. Jerry Fraser, publisher of National Fishermen, says it's one thing to limit the harvest, another to shut a fishery down completely. Jerry, who first went shrimping in 1971, explains the changes he's seen in the fishery. I first came down to Portland shrimping right after I got out of high school, or a year after I got out of high school, and I got on one of the big draggers down here, and it was a very different fleet. In those days, uh, it was wooden boats, side draggers, and in the wintertime, virtually everyone went shrimping. It was a vastly larger fleet than it is today. It's a cyclical fishery, and I am not sure that the pressure that the main boats put on it really has that much to do with the resource. We're kind of out on the end of the range of shrimp down here. And so what I saw was that, you know, they would come along in the winter, and we would whale away on them and fish them for all we were worth, and then they'd pooch in the spring. Uh, you'd see a handful of guys go in the summer, but not many. And then in the fall of the following year, they'd, they'd gain up again. And by uh, the end of December, everybody was hammering away at them. I'm not so sure that the fishing pressure is, is in, in Maine, in New England, has that much impact on them. I almost think that you could have had a fishery this year. Um, and if there's not a lot of shrimp, maybe uh, peel out some of the boats, make some, some way to determine who's going and who's not. But for a lot of these small lobster boats, uh, the shrimp trappers, I don't really think they would harm the body of shrimp out there now, and I think a lot of them really could use the money. It's no secret that commercial fishing is a dangerous business. In fact, with a rate of 117 deaths per 100,000 workers, it's the second most dangerous job, next to logging, in the U.S. 
That according to a National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, also known as NIOSH. But now Alaska, a state where, despite an improved record in recent years, fishing is the, the most dangerous job, is calling for a study of the patterns surrounding both fatal and non-fatal injuries aboard fishing boats. According to NIOSH, a Dutch Harbor Health Center treated 366 fishermen for traumatic injuries in 2007 and 2008. More than two-thirds of the fishermen were injured while at sea, and the majority of the injuries were sprains, strains, contusions, or upper body fractures. The Department of Epidemiology says a study that looks at the risk factors and accident rates over a period of years would result in a safer industry. Rhode Island is supporting the efforts of fellow New England states who are suing in federal court to secure more fish for their ground fishermen. The suit, brought last spring by Massachusetts and joined by New Hampshire, is an effort to roll back deep, some would say devastating, cuts and catch limits, such as a 78% reduction in cod. In addition, the suit calls for regulators to take into account the economic impact of the rules they impose on fishermen. In its amicus brief, Rhode Island asserts that the cuts mean the end of commercial fishing as the heart of coastal communities in Massachusetts. Rhode Island has a stake in the lawsuit. While its fishery is similar but not identical to Massachusetts, the state contends that the regulations could compromise its own fishery conservation efforts. The next time, it could be us, said a spokeswoman for the Rhode Island Attorney General's office. North Carolina's commercial fishermen aren't the only ones bemoaning a million pound reduction in the summer flounder quota. Fresh fluke, as they are also known, are extremely popular with diners in the Tar Heel State. And when they come off the menu, restaurants say they pay the price. Trip Engel, chef at Brasserie du Soleil in Wilmington, tells the Daily News of Jacksonville, North Carolina, that summer flounder are his top selling item. He says he has had customers get up and walk out of the restaurant when he has a substitute fish on the menu because he was unable to get flounder. The 2014 quota for North Carolina's commercial fishermen is 2.9 million pounds, about 27% of the overall commercial quota, down from 3.14 million pounds this year. From the standpoint of the resource, the quota reduction is not a bad sign. After being slashed in the 90s, the quota has been increasing, and so has the catch. Officials with the State Department of Marine Fisheries say they have a healthy fishery and intend to keep it that way. And now, National Fisherman's Boats and Gear Editor, Michael Crowley, with product news. I'm Michael Crowley, Boats and Gear Editor at National Fisherman and in charge of the product pages. And the message of some products featured in National Fisherman is stronger and more immediate than others. A good example is the Mustang Inflatable Work Vest, model MD3188 in the March 2010 National Fisherman. It's just like the one I'm holding in my hand, which was furnished by Hamilton Marine in Portland, Maine. This is more than just another PFD. In fact, there's a bit of a backstory to the Mustang PFD. In October 2008, the National Institute of Safety and Health in Anchorage, Alaska, did a study on f commercial fishermen's opinions on PFDs. Six different PFDs were distributed among 200 fishermen and used for a month of fishing. At that time, the Mustang vest was a prototype. But after that month of being used by the fishermen, it was rated the best of the PFDs, probably because it was designed for commercial fishermen and it was designed for comfort and to be easy to clean. When National Fishermen ran the Mustang product story, it was also the only work vest with type 2 and type 5 Coast Guard approval ratings. Thanks, Mike. Next, a look at a phone app that is making it easier for fishermen in the Virgin Islands to provide the regulating government agency with required data about their catch. A new smartphone app could make paper logbooks a thing of the past. Digital Deck is a data collection and reporting tool designed to make it easier for fishermen to provide reliable fishery harvest data. Charles Steinbeck, director of marine planning for Point 97, the Portland-based company that creates the technology, explains how the app came about. You know, so over time I've worked a lot with fishermen and worked with fisheries data and as technology's kind of been advancing around, you know, just the use of mobile phones and, you know, that they're GPS enabled, um, there seemed like there was, you know, things were trending towards probably a more efficient way of collecting data. Um, 
about you know where fishermen go and what they do and so that information can be available both to the agencies for these different planning spatial planning processes but also to return you know that data back to fishermen so that they can start to use it for their own business purposes the technology is currently being used in a pilot program by fishermen in the u.s virgin islands right now in the virgin islands each uh fishermen are re required to fill out a catch report and that's um you know just a paper form so right, what we did is basically replicated that catch um, report into an app. Fishermen input the same information that they used to record on paper into their phone. When they're done, if they have cell service, they hit send and the information is transferred to the regulatory agency. If they're out of cell range, they can save the information and it will be transmitted when they again have coverage. Jessica Hathaway, National Fisherman's Editor-in-Chief, thinks that this technology will appeal to some fishermen. I certainly think some fishermen would be excited to move to a digital platform. I, I think a pilot program is a great idea because it identifies some of the weaknesses and strengths. I personally would worry if fishermen are out of data range, uh, what would happen to their data if anything happened to their phone before their data is uploaded. Um, you can always have problems with paper charts as well, but fishermen are used to paper. So, um, you know, I think the transition may be slow, but over time it may, be, it may be something that fishermen are drawn to naturally because most of them have smartphones on board, many of them have iPads on board and an app where they could log their information fairly easily, um, especially probably for younger generations of fishermen, is certainly something that they might be inclined to use. This pilot program is working out the technical mechanics of how data is transmitted from a phone in a form that managers can use right away. The data is sent to the USVI fishery managers to be verified. So they are able to verify it, then it sends kind of uh, a receipt back to the fishermen as well as sends that data off to the um, to NIMS, Fishery Science Center. So fishery managers get the catch data in almost real time, and fishermen gain a real-time digital log of their fish history. Although each fisherman using the app is only able to access their own data and not the aggregated data received by the agencies, Jessica Hathaway thinks that some fishermen will be concerned about the security of their information. Fishermen are always going to be concerned not only about where their data is being stored and managed, but who has access to it once it's been uploaded somewhere. For more commercial fishing news and analysis, subscribe to National Fisherman Magazine Visit our website at www.nationalfisherman.com or subscribe to our twice-weekly e-newsletter. For National Fisherman Live, I'm Leslie Taylor.